All right, so I am James Coltrane. I'm about a three-week-old professor at the University of Nebraska. I'm an early American historian uh, and then also in the Center for Digital Research and Humanities there. Um, as part of my historical research, I'm very interested in architecture and material culture, especially using those as sources to sort of complement texts and to get at the experience of uh, historical people that may not appear in texts. And so, you know, even if they don't come up in records, we have records of other people and then compare those to architectural environments, we can get a sense of sort of how they're experiencing society, how they work, how they worship, um, and particularly in my, in my dissertation, how they experience the rules of, of empires. And uh, anytime you're trying to create a, a three-dimensional reconstruction of the past, uh, there's all sorts of um, very, very fraught issues with interpretation, and you often, uh, even to just come up with a coherent environment, end up having to make a lot more guesses about things than maybe uh, an archaeologist or an architectural historian uh, would have been comfortable with a few years ago. And so typically when we see 3D reconstructions, uh, they tend to be um, very, very uh, sort of as objective as possible. So, you know, if you dig up a column, you know, the measurements of the column, maybe you feel comfortable showing sort of a geometric structure for that. Um, but there's many more things that go into an environment that produce meaning. Uh, and it's difficult because you have to decide whether or not to take more of a leap and sort of represent those artistically uh, or to leave them out and possibly miss some of the interpretation and cultural meaning of that space. So what I'm gonna be talking about today um, are some technologies that have been developed uh, for things like uh, feature film, special effects, and video games uh, that are a little closer to the objective side of things so that maybe we can get into simulating uh, some of the additional sort of phenomenological aspects of a space uh, without feeling like we're jumping uh, way, way further down the interpretive wormhole uh, than we might normally do with other sources. Um, and all of us have probably had the experience, if we're planning a trip somewhere that we've never been before, of trying to imagine what that place would feel like. Uh, and this may be particularly true for famous landmarks places that we've seen on television or in film, uh, or that we've looked up on the internet. Um, however, sometimes when we actually arrive in those places, um, they may feel totally different than we had imagined. We see sort of all the same stuff, but maybe it feels more grand, or maybe it feels more intimate, maybe it's more crowded or more isolated than we expected, it could be more dirty, more serene, uh, and so on. And I had this experience uh, finally going to Italy for the first time this summer. I was very, very excited to see uh, the Pieta, uh, and of course the experience of actually seeing that looks something more like this. Uh, where you have a whole crowd, and people are crowding to get <laughs> cell phone pictures, and it's behind glass, uh, back in a little chapel. And so there's nothing about you know this representation that is a lie, but when you're actually there in, in physical space, uh, the, you know the memory and the meaning that you take away from that is very, very different. And there's all kinds of factors. They contribute to this. Uh, lighting, uh, weather, the texture of materials, sounds, smells, uh, perspective, where you are in the building, um, and of course uh, even psychological and cultural elements, all of your previous sets of expectations and your uh, cultural beliefs about, uh, about spaces and symbols and all that good stuff. Um, and scholars who are interested in space and aesthetics have written extensively about trying to unpack these factors and they've used concepts like phenomenology or sometimes called the poetics of places. Um, and if we want to understand to the best of our ability uh, how places influenced and reflected past cultures, uh, you know, ideally we want to get as close to sort of uh, this sort of richer, more complicated experience as we can. Um, and within the past few decades, 3D uh, modeling has led to a massive leap in the sophistication of uh, our reconstruction of past spaces. Um, for years, if you were studying historic architecture, uh, especially in a published monograph that had limits for illustrations and something, you might only end up with something like that, a flat plan or maybe an elevated section. Uh, and 3D has instantly uh, expanded uh, our capabilities to represent space, uh, to do uh, perspective reconstructions very quickly, to look from multiple views, to do fly-throughs and walk-throughs and those sorts of things. And so already, um, our representations of a historic space can become much more complicated. Um, and with 3D models, 
we can recreate uh, particular architectural features on some of the sorts of you know solid presence properties that were being mentioned early earlier fairly well um, and depending upon the complexity of the model and the computing power that we have uh, we not only may be able to produce animations but we may actually be able to load those uh, in the game engines we can walk around those in real time uh, and that gives us all kinds of benefits in terms of uh, forming new theories and making new discoveries about spaces and it also makes it easier to communicate our theories about space to people uh, while saving a lot of words and hopefully also a lot of disciplinary jargon. Um, however, even if we have a highly accurate 3D model, we're still falling quite a bit short of the historical reconstructions that might capture that sort of feeling of being there, the cultural and atmospheric experience of a place. Uh, what I've been showing you are representations of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, uh, which actually uh, was the first sort of uh, structure that I got interested in as far as 3D goes um, when I was taking some uh, classes getting ready for grad school here at Kansas, which is my, also my under, alma mater. And uh, if we look at something like this, this is a very good formal representation of the main architectural elements of the church. Uh, and we could look at that and sort of feel like if we sort of are uh, architecturally literate uh, that we could place ourselves in there and kind of get a sense of what, what this space is like and what it would be like to be there. Um, but since we have the benefit of this church still existing, uh, if we look at a photograph from the interior of the church, uh, we see all of these different factors uh, and aspects of materiality that are really affecting the way the space feels. So in this former representation, uh, we may just have an arch and a floor and columns. Uh, and when you're actually there, uh, light is light and shadow are actually absolutely huge in defining sort of how this looks and feels and what stands out for you. Um, and we could see uh, reflections on the marble floor. We can see the color contrast uh, in the decorative uh, stonework. We can see uh, the orange glow of those oil lamps and the glint and reflections from gold and brass finishes. Um, and so this gives us a, a problem because we're seeing how potentially valuable uh, light and shadow and texture are, uh, but these are things that would be very, very difficult for a scholar, even somebody who uh, maybe is working in, in fine arts or architectural history and, and really has a command uh, of representing space artistically. Uh, this would take a, a significant amount of artistic skill to reproduce and then you would be subject uh, to all kinds of potential interpretive pitfalls. Um, and so today I'm going to take you through some technologies, again, that have uh, been employed by uh, archaeologists and historians and art historians uh, that are attempting at least to go beyond uh, an artistic, uh, uh, more speculative reconstruction and attempt as much as possible to sort of inject a little bit of more uh, objective scientific um, ways of calculating into the way that we're trying to reconstruct rich sort of textured spaces. Um, and far and away the most powerful element in terms of the realism that we get when we look at a uh, manufactured 3D image uh, is lighting. Um, and this is something that until maybe the last decade or so, uh, computers could not do a really great job with. I'm going to show you just a little room that I made yesterday in a, in a 3D suite. And so this has the most elementary form of uh, computer lighting. We have one light source and it's projecting down. Um, and you can see that an early simple simulation of computer light is a lot like shining a flashlight in a dark room. Uh, they project light in one direction. You get these very, very hard black shadows uh, that mask everything that they touch. Um, so in a simple computer, when light hits a surface, it just stops. And of course, this is not how light actually behaves at all. Uh, when real light strikes a surface, some of it is absorbed. Uh, some of it bounces off, now weakened because of the light that's absorbed, the stuff that's coming off the surface now has a colored tint. Um, and uh, this can really affect sort of the mood or the interpretation of a place. Uh, and if you don't think, you know, if you can't imagine uh, how light tint might have a powerful sort of cultural meaning, uh, all of you have pro probably remember when the first like LED Christmas lights came out and sort of how, how fake and fluorescent and tinny they, they looked compared to the incandescent ones. Um, and so even subtle changes can make a big difference in, in interpreting the space. Um, computer artists eventually tried to simulate the way that light behaves 
And so you would put another light down here to represent the bounce from the floor that was weaker, that was tinted green, and then you would have other lights that, that bounced off the walls, but they couldn't illuminate the wall they were bouncing off of. Um, and people who were very skilled at this could make things that looked pretty realistic, but there was quite a bit a lot of um, subjective determination in there. It was also very, very time consuming um, and took a high degree of skill. Um, I should also add, this is equally as true for outdoor lighting, because even though um, you know sunlight being a very uh, sort of strong central path, and if you go outside on a sunny day, uh, you have nice you know sharp shadows that are coming from one angle from the sun. The light is also bouncing off of the atmosphere, and so you're actually getting light from every single direction in addition to the light direct from the sun, and it's tinted blue or gray or orange depending upon where the sun is in the sky. Um, so faking bounces and tints and things helps quite a bit, uh, but this technique was still pretty arbitrary uh, and imperfect. Um, so eventually computer scientists uh, and uh, people at the leading edge of graphics started experimenting with scientifically simulating light. And so uh, virtual light sources would actually shoot out simulated photons, uh, which would bounce and tint and degrade. Uh, and they also made it possible uh, to simulate uh, virtual light sources with objective lighting measurements. So you could put in uh, a light bulb that was 60 watts and you could rate that for how many lumens or whatever that is. And so when we carry out one of these simulations with a scientifically correct light, uh, we get a much more natural <coughs> picture. And again, this is just from one light source. Um, and so that gives us sort of a little bit of a head start on understanding maybe how these places actually look when they're inhabited. Um, scientific simulation of lighting uh, gets particularly interested with exterior scenes. Uh, and uh, you know, I don't have to tell you uh, how many different sources of light can come from a thunderstorm since we're all in Kansas. Uh, but obviously, you know, weather uh, uh, patterns and everything can affect the way a landscape looks uh, greatly and we're a ways away from being able to simulate those. Uh, but we can simulate things like uh, the time of day, the position of the sun and the horizon, and the color that it's tinted based on uh, how high it is in the sky and how much of that light uh, is actually crossing through the, uh, the atmosphere, as well as things like uh, the season and the place that you are geographically on the earth. And all of that can affect the way that simulated light is hitting um, a historic site. Um, there's even applications that have been developed by humanist scholars uh, that use scientific astronomical calculations to backwards project the exact positions of um, sun angles going back millennia. So you can have a simulation where you say, I have an Egyptian or a Roman temple and I want to know in 1500 BC where the shadow would line up on the solstice or something like that. And so it gives you a head start at trying to uh, form new theories about the astrological significance of an ancient structure. Um, of course, simulated light will only look as realistic as the surface that it is striking. And so people in 3D technology have also been working on uh, computational routines that simulate the way that texture uh, of specific materials respond to light. Um, so the very simplest textures uh, are based on photographs and are shaded by algorithms, uh, but sort of the duller or the planar in the surface you have, something like concrete or dirt or sand, uh, is pretty easy for a computer to uh, calculate. And then pretty soon we start adding uh, dimensions as we get into trickier and trickier substances. So this is a computer uh, scientific simulation of plastic. You can see now, uh, because of the glossiness, uh, we have to deal with outright um, reflections that are going to mirror the virtual environment around that. They're going to require a fair amount of calculating. Um, you can even go further and simulate different kinds of metals. And so uh, these are all the same 3D model. This is all the same lighting situation. Uh, but the simulation that the program is using to represent different materials gives us very, very different appearances for these objects, which could be very, very important if you're an archaeologist that is concerned with a very precise interpretation of material culture. Um, here's one that's gold, uh, and you can see uh, that little little differences in the way that the computer calculates the play of light make a big difference in, in whether something feels authentic or not. And 
uh, one of the reasons that gold uh, is distinct and lustrous is if you look at this, uh, even in the brightest spots or the darkest spots of the reflection, gold tints the light yellow. Um, and that is what gives it a metallic appearance. If that's not part of your simulation uh, and you have a yellow base that, that goes all the way white uh, reflections, it will look sort of cheap or plasticky. Um, and these extend to other materials like glass, where we're dealing with uh, complex refractions and how light is bending when it hits and goes in different directions. So that's true of both grass and water. Um, and so people use really advanced optics theory to calculate how these simulated photons are striking things and bending uh, depending upon both the, uh, the properties of the material as well as its shape. Um, and this is something that we actually uh, can get pretty objective about because different materials have what's called an index of refraction that determines uh, how light behaves in them and that's something that can be uh, reduced to a numerical calculation. So you can have the same 3D model and if you tell it to have an index of a refraction, certain kind, it will look more plasticky. If you give it another kind, it may look more like glass or even like a diamond. Uh, so here are some just simple spheres that have been rendered with different indexes of refraction. And, and also here's the same cup that's given different properties by the renderer. Um, and so it just to our eyes instantly looks like it may be made out of different materials. Uh, okay. Okay. Moving into even more complex uh, surfaces, even though it requires a significant amount of computing power, uh, 3D programs are beginning to uh, simulate translucence, translucency, which is really important if you want to realistically depict something like wax or clay uh, or vegetation or even uh, human skin. Uh, we know from when we were a little kid and we held our uh, hand over a flashlight. Uh, that you can see light coming through that. It's because your skin and your flesh is actually translucent. So when light strikes that, it's bouncing all around and then coming out the other ends, uh, even though it's much, much weaker. Um, and so 3D programmers have developed our routines that go under the, the broad name subsurface scattering uh, that calculate how virtual photons behave in translucent uh, surfaces. Uh, really quickly, here's a couple more pictures of uh, of it calculating the light that's actually leaving uh, refractive surfaces after it goes out and then how that will strike other objects in the scene. And then this is an example of the differences between subsurface scattering. Uh, so this is using a simple sort of material shader for a 3D model and uh, you can see that this just feels very cold and sort of uh, more CGI because this person's cheek is going completely black for the shadow as if she is totally opaque. Um, and then if we look at the more advanced version, even though this is not completely convincing, it looks much more realistic and lifelike and sort of human because the light is bouncing around in the surface and a little bit of it is leaking out of the opposite ends. Um, this also does a really good job of simulating certain kinds of foggy glasses or clay. Um, I found somebody's really interesting portfolio study where they had uh, put a subsurface scattering routine on fruit. And so this shows you their um, best guess at the amount of uh, translucency that different pieces of fruit have. And then this is the exact same model with the exterior color surfaces applied. And so we get a fairly uh, lifelike, maybe this is something that people can, can work on and tweak. Uh, but a much more realistic depiction of uh, organic matter than we might get um, from some of the early ways of, of uh, simulating these materials. Uh, I know earlier today people were talking about the, the physicality of books um, and the things that are lost in the digital presence and so uh, things like simulating translucency could be very useful if you wanted to get a, a true understanding of what it might have been like to read, uh, say, a medieval illuminated manuscript, where you have uh, the translucency of the, the vellum itself, the fact that there are letters on the back that will show through because the paper is sort of see-through. Uh, and then we can also combine some of these techniques. So in that example, uh, we would want to be simulating uh, the gilt uh, on, the, uh, on the capitals uh, and the more matte surfaces associated uh, with uh, regular paint. Um, okay. 
And of course, even as we attempt to scientifically simulate light coming into a scene, hitting, interacting, and leaving with objects, uh, we're still missing a final and third element that all combines uh, in the process of us seeing things, and that's the perception of the viewer. Uh, and this is a particularly tricky thing because uh, obviously what shows up or light, or what shows up as light or dark when we inhabit a space, uh, it actually depends on certain context because our eyes can only look at so much of a visible spectrum. And when we go indoors or outdoors, our irises are expanding and contracting and changing what in a given scene is the brightest and what in a given scene is, is the darkest. Um, and so uh, computer programmers have tried to, to counteract this to add an element of objectivity by simulating virtual cameras. So you can have a virtual camera in one of these scenes and you can uh, give it real life um, calculations like the lens aperture and the shutter speed uh, and so on. And the idea is in that in the final version, uh, if you're using a scientifically simulated scene with proper light and proper material and proper camera setting, that to the degree that those things are, are accurate and quality reproductions, that if you went and took a uh, photograph of a certain you know, marble column in a certain place in the world on a certain day, and then you rendered that uh, on the computer, that they should be fairly close to one another. Um, but there's still uh, you know, ways in which uh, this can become a little messier, because our eyes actually have a wider range of light that we can view at one time than a camera does. And so you'll see people attempting to sort of mimic the way our eyes behave uh, using techniques like uh, high dynamic range <coughs> photography. And so this is uh, when you're blending images together. Uh, so these are different exposures that are taken with the photograph. And then they have been combined here to try to simulate uh, the wider range of light and dark that a person can see with their own eye. Um, and of course, this person who is a, an artist shows us the danger for historical recreations because we can also sort of spruce them up and make them sort of Disney Pixar-like uh, in a way that maybe is not reflective of uh, you know an individual's experience. Right. Um, now that I've given you an idea of how potentially accurate uh, some of these simulations could be, even for a scholar that's uh, working on sort of an introductory level with computer graphics. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of a spire from a church that I've written about uh, called the Old South Meeting House in Boston. Uh, it's a Puritan or Congregational church that was built in the 1720s and it's gone through uh, various renovations, but the spire is still standing today. Um, and uh, at this resolution and distance, you know, uh, obviously this is a little bit different exposure. The lights, the sun is in a little bit different position in the sky. But you can see that for just dropping this in a scene and assigning it a place in the world and a time of day and just clicking uh, go instead of individually tweaking all of the, the settings with the, the lighting that we're actually getting a, a pretty good uh, representation of the simulated structure versus a photo of the actual structure. And although there you know, is definitely uh, talent and arguments to be had about tweaking the settings here, uh, this is still much, much more um, sort of objective or consistent uh, than if you were doing this in the old method and placing lights around the scene to try to reproduce uh, what you thought um, uh, a photograph was uh, communicating to you. Um, I want to also show you, I have a, a video clip of an animation of the same spire. We can see this a little bit closer. And again, that may strike you as looking computer generated for different reasons, probably particularly the movement of the camera, uh, but it's a big, big improvement on the sorts of things that. Uh, we would have been able to do even as recently as maybe five or seven years ago. Um, now part of the reason that I was able to get so close to the original uh, appearance is because this church still exists and I could, I could look at a photograph uh, for reference, um, especially with those exposure controls sort of mimicking the camera and guess about where I was going to end up. Um, 
But we can see uh, the benefits of this sort of technology when we look at a reconstruction that was done uh, before people had access to sort of scientifically simulated surfaces. This is a reconstruction from an artist of the inside of the Parthenon. Um, and you know, level of detail is an issue in this reconstruction, but I think all of us would agree that this is, this is, this is, this is pretty good. I mean, this is a decent representation of the space. Uh, but again, this person is just sort of guessing like a painter about the properties of light in the scene. And because this building also exists, uh, if we look at a photograph of the space, we can see uh, ways in which the lighting is more complex uh, and some of the assumptions that are made for instance, this floor in this image is pretty much perfectly flat, and the reflections are consistent across the entire surface of the floor. Um, and in the real image, there's a lot more variation uh, because some of these uh, uh, stones are more polished than others. There's little bits of undulation in the uh, surface of the floor that break things up. And that may seem kind of finicky, but when you combine all of these elements together, again, we're, we're thinking about sort of a different presence of a space that we inhabit. So I've been telling you about all of these different uh, techniques and technologies, uh, how potentially uh, we might be able to uh, build reconstructions that are, that are more realistic uh, or possibly even more objective. But what are the potential interpretive payoffs of this technology? Um, for those of us who agree that the phenomenological element of a space is something uh, that affects cultural experience and meaning, uh, and that we would, we would like to be able to try to imagine the way that light and texture are playing a role. Um, you know, we might think to ourselves that if we have a particular skill or experience or working with other scholars that know a lot about architecture and spaces, that we'd be able to make a pretty good guess about how a place feels, even if we, if we can't do these sorts of things. Uh, and so, uh, as an example, I think to argue about the possible benefits of this technology in terms of interpretation, I've thrown together uh, a very, very simple, sort of silly 3D model, uh, which is sort of an imaginary, vaguely classic structure that doesn't represent anything that exists anywhere in the world. Uh, but I first rendered this using the simple lighting that I was showing before. Um, I didn't put any shadows in this view because they would have been completely black uh, and obscured the scene. And this model is not very detailed. These are just, uh, you know, rectangles. Uh, everything except for the columns is, is just uh, blocks. Um, but you might look at this and think that you could still say some useful things about sort of the, the dimension and the feel of this space. Uh, certainly the ex interior frescoes stand out uh, in comparison to the relatively drab concrete exterior. Uh, and the structure design seems very, very uh, simple. Uh, the whole thing is pretty unassuming, uh, plain, maybe even sort of tacky, uh, and rests very, very lightly on the ground. If I take this exact same very, very primitive model and render it with scientifically accurate exterior lighting, we get a pretty significant difference. Um, all of a sudden, it seems to look sort of more established, more weighty, more grounded. Uh, the columns now are dominant in the appearance of the, the front of the building, uh, and the interior frescoes are minimized, uh, and the scene may feel uh, at least relative to the other one, maybe more stately, more elegant, uh, more distant or aloof. Uh, again, these are all things that uh, people like to talk about, architecture and spaces could argue about, uh, but I would, I would suggest that they'd come to very, very different conclusions if they're looking at a scientifically simulated image as opposed to uh, one that was based on earlier methods. And of course, we could take this even further by trying to simulate the artificial lighting that people might have used on this space. Um, and there's more variables in, in something like this so this is more uncertain than doing something like simple sunlight, and I guess we can just barely see this. Um, but this is a depiction of how this might look uh, if braziers were lighting the structure from the, the bottom. Uh, and now the front columns and the frescoes sort of blend together in kind of a pinkish, orangish hue, or on this projector, very, very dark gray. Uh, you can uh, take me at my word that they're sort of more uh, unified by color. Um, and this, in contrast to the previous image, uh, feels much more sort of warm, uh, central, uh, maybe even sort of genial uh, as a space. Um, and I think that these variations could be useful if we're trying to unpack things like the uh, 
uh, intention that architecture is applying, an architect is applying to a structure when he's when he's building it. There are things that look uh, ornamental and central in the abstract, but when they're put in a lit situation, all of a sudden they disappear, and other elements of the building become important. Uh, or if we were trying to sort of imagine the way a civic building might have felt uh, intimidating. Uh, or inspiring or the opposite of those things. Um, the sorts of ways a church or temple might have shaped the meaning of worship or how a given urban setting might impact uh, the sort of reception of a public performance. Um, and I would suggest that the more realistically that we can simulate light, uh, the better chance that we have uh, of uh, producing theories about the past meanings of spaces that come closer to what people may have actually thought. Um, these material properties can also potentially help us in interpretations of artifacts. And of course, if we have an artifact to begin with, uh, that puts us in pretty good shape. Uh, but because of the ways materials age and degrade over time, uh, it would be wonderful both for analysis as well as possibly for historic preservation and public presentation uh, if we could simulate how materials uh, appeared before they went through processes of yellowing and rusting, eroding, uh, uh, gathering soot or acid rain, uh, colors fading, mold, uh, all of the various ways that, that things can transform over time. Uh, and I have a much simpler example here. Uh, I pulled off of the internet a little image of a Roman glass vase uh, that had warped and clouded over the course of a couple of millennia. Um, now I'm not an expert on Roman glass at all or uh, the, the practice of, of blowing vases. Uh, but if I, I knew enough, if I had expertise in this area, um, I would probably uh, be able to look at people who do similar crafts um, in the world today. Uh, and because of the sophisticated routines that you can use to simulate materials, I might be able to produce uh, a conjecture of how this vase might have originally looked, um, which again would give us uh, possibly a vastly different interpretation of sort of um, the presence or the cultural significance of this object. Um, this is something that could be very beneficial to a, a, an art historian uh, or a museum director. So, even though these material simulations are, are very powerful uh, and their use by humanists is still very much in its infancy, uh, there are obviously a number of challenges for scholars that are trying to recreate past spaces. Uh, first and most obvious, uh, even beyond things like the play of light or the uh, texture of certain materials, there's still countless other variables that are involved in depicting an architectural scene in use. Uh, these are things like decorations or the way that human inhabitants uh, visit it. Um, and uh, although technology will make it easier as we go forward to add more and more details to a scene, uh, you know, these are still things that are going to require lots of different uh, difficult judgments about uh, presentation and interpretation. Uh, and there's also things that have nothing to do with the material that greatly affect um, somebody's interpretation of a space, uh, the perspective of a particular historical subject, uh, why they're going to visit a structure, uh, how it might accommodate or exclude them depending upon where they are in society, um, and how you might compare those to uh, people from other segments of a, of a past culture um, and who's sort of imagined interpretation you might lean on. Uh, let's see. And then there's other elements where scholars are focusing on the possibility of adding more dimensions to things that could be quasi-scientifically simulated. Um, and the most promising of these uh, are acoustic simulations of historic spaces uh, that would use some of these same material properties to calculate uh, the way that sound is behaving, how we might respond to a political speaker or a, or a religious uh, leader of some sort. Uh, as far as I know, no one has a smell simulator in development, which we can probably all be grateful for. Um, but there's still other challenges that remain in the production of, of spaces. Uh, and one of these, for all of these techniques, is the amount of computer power that's necessary to uh, render one of these images. Uh, if you're dealing with a still picture or recorded animation, uh, it would be possible, depending upon your scene, uh, to reproduce a nearly photorealistic result. Again, this depends on your skill. On the animation of the church tower that I showed you, each frame of that took about 90 seconds of a desktop computer to render. So that's a significant amount of time, but it's not an overwhelming amount of time. 
However, if we're talking about real-time presentations, if we wanted to give people an experience that was more like a video game where they'd be able to walk through a simulated space, then we're talking about calculating uh, maybe 30, 40, 50, 60 frames uh, per second. And so uh, if a computer can only do one of those in 90 second increments now, we are a ways away from allowing somebody to be able to interact and sort of uh, you know, work with something that is as realistically simulated as this face. Um, so for all these reasons, uh, scientific simulations of past materiality are still subject to many interpretive pitfalls and criticisms of the same way that architectural reconstructions in pen and ink have been for many years before. Uh, and in some cases, uh, there may be the fear that the ability for scholars to reproduce more features of a past environment, even if some of them have somewhat objective parameters, uh, could potentially just open up new and exciting ways for humanists to misinterpret their sources. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I think that um, there's much potentially to be gained from at least striving towards new uh, techniques of illustrations. Uh, and I think that the more fully realized uh, an image can be or the more interpretive attempts that we make, uh, the more lines of analysis that we produce and potentially along with them uh, new interesting questions. So I'll finish up there and take any questions. Just, just a comment, um, Muzak, Scent Air, they're already digitizing scent. The Muzak people, yeah. <laughs> Is that through like little sample, like a hundred different particles? Uh, scent like domes, that? there's yeah. actually digitizing scent. Just, All right. yes, yes, someone's ahead of you, sorry. So we have to, we have to, well, I, <laughs> I was not interested in scent, <laughs> but we'll all have to watch out for that. That could be a, that could be a very dicey peer review process. <laughs> Kind of a tension here I'm interested in your comment on. So at times you seem to be talking about accurately representing objects, buildings, artifacts in a way that lets us get back into some past state as this example is here perhaps, or 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 uh, be able to you know take measurements from it or whatever it is. Other times you're talking more about what a simulating the experience of being there mm -hmm. with that object. Those don't seem to be the exactly the same thing. And I would also uh, want to argue that the first is actually in some sense easier than the second, and there may be some real limitations with this kind of presentation to the second. So I've always been bothered in 3D movies by the fact that it's nothing like the real world in the right. following sense. Either part of the scene is in focus, and if I look to another part of the scene, it's out of focus. My eyes don't work like that, right? The mm -hmm. world doesn't work like that. Or it's all in focus which is also gives me an experience that's completely unlike anything, right? But, but, because my eyes do actually right, adjust right. them out. And the same is true for all of these these, these renderings that you've got here, right? You, you've either cho you've chosen a, a, a depth of field or you everything is shown, mm -hmm. right? Now, if you're sort of after some measurable thing, right? Everything in focus is probably what you want, right? But if you want to get the experience, you can't actually allow this dynamic interaction, at least with the technology we've heard so far, between an individual viewer interacting with it and their experience of this sort of shift of focus and attention. Right, no, I think that's absolutely true. And so I think, you know, what what's exciting to me about these methods is that it, it gets us closer. Um, it, it maybe allows us to, to to posit new arguments and to put those out to a community and see if people sort of natural instincts, or especially people who are experts in certain cultures, if, that's persuasive to them or if they, they agree with them, uh, but it's, it's, it's always going to be incomplete in a, in a ways off. And it's, it's, I think it's a similar leap to, you know, if you could only show somebody uh, flat images like we had at the very, very beginning versus a sort of plain, boxy, geometric, kind of Lego looking model. Um, I think that's a bit, I think the Lego model is a big advance on the sorts of uh, articulations you could make about how a space might have felt and see whether or not people buy those. Uh, but it's obviously incomplete, and so I think these are just taking us a, a, another step, giving us a, you know a, even further that we may be able to to make conjectures. But there's you know there's uh, if you're talking about somebody's perception, you know there's pretty much an unlimited amount of factors that could that could complicate that. But because we're scholars, we we make theories about them anyway. But I was also sort of wondering, is there a step that that just can't be taken at all because of the fact that we're our eyes are physical objects in our bodies that, that have their own properties that are not 
being in, they're not in the simulation at all. Yeah, um, I don't know in terms of like being able to focus on like, a, you know, I'm thinking of like Google Glass type stuff like that. I know there's a, a headset that has come out recently um, off of Kickstarter where something that it has that's interesting is it, it allows you to, it has uh, accelerometers like an iPhone. So when you tilt your head, uh, it, it keep it, you know, the, the thing tilts as if it, like you're tilting your head so the display doesn't tilt with you, it, it adjusts. So it gives you a sense of sort of being in the space. And the same thing when you look down the view, you're, you know, you're looking down, it doesn't stay looking forward, it actually changes based on, so that's, that's an example of one of those problems being solved. I don't, I don't know what technology exists for, for depth of field, but, you know, again, I just think that, you know, we may continually lose the camera format closer. Allows you to change um, focal depth of field. Change it in reaction to to my voluntary attention to the scene. No, but I mean that's just fairly simple correlation though between yeah. your, where you are. Yeah. You could give somebody the option to, yeah. with what he's talking about, it's this uh, Lytro is the commercial camera that's been developed for this, but you could, um, like you could click on a particular uh, point in a picture and then it would focus on that and make the rest of the stuff blurry. But in, in terms of like, you know, what we experience when we actually, you know, look and, and focus both eyes on something. I don't, I don't know if there's anything that exists for that. Uh, you had your hand up before. Yeah. yeah. So I have, I have two questions. Uh, the first is, for objects that are already in the world or buildings that are already in the world, why not just use photogrammetry, especially if you're after um, historical realism? And then the second question is whether you've tried using, um, say, historical collections of images to pull volumetric data from those images mm -hmm. that would alleviate a lot of, again, questions about the, the photorealism. I think there's a, there's a couple of responses to that. The, the first thing is that, you know, if you're looking at something, you know, that's two 2,000 years old or something like that, you want to get back to, you want to project back to its its state when it was quote-unquote new or whatever. So, you know, if you're interested in the uh, Greek statues, we've learned now that they were painted in really garish pink and purple colors and things like that, and so we, we can't use photogrammetry to get at that. The other thing, um, a weakness of photogrammetry or laser scanning, they're really good for getting the dimensions of an object, and they're, they're precise at taking measurements. So if you had something, you know, it would take somebody that was very high skilled to, to duplicate the Pieta, say, but you could scan it and you could get every single one of those folds exactly. Mm -hmm. The weakness of photos is that they encode um, light data from one particular moment in time. So, for instance, you know, if you take a photogrammetry uh, picture of this podium, the, the shade of blue that you're going to get is only what is through the camera that you're using, reflecting the lights that are on right now and hitting it in a position. And so we want to try to abstract more and simulate that material so we could put it in an environment where we could change the time of day and then the surface uh, appearance of the object would change the I, I'm an archaeologist and an architectural historian and I've done quite a lot of this kind of uh, computer modeling. Um, but more recently, I've gotten more interested in photogrammetry and laser scanning, um, mostly because uh, and I can use the example of this Roman vase. If you go back to, if you go back, go back to the, the photograph. Yeah. The, the photograph shows that this this thing is not symmetrical. You know, it 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 has. Um, you can you can tell that it was made by human hands. Now, if you go to your computer model, you know, mm -hmm. you have eliminated the asymmetry and you have taken away a lot of the subtle. Uh, flaws. Um, right. Uh, my, my point is with, with laser scanning, one of the reasons why it's uh, now so popular with uh, people like me is that uh, in the old days, we would, in, uh, when I say old days, I mean 1999 uh, or in the 90s, we would make an abstract model of the ruins of a Roman building or, or the Pantheon. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there are limitations for the scholar in doing that because uh, what we're now interested in are all of those, uh, <coughs> let's, let's call them flaws, or the effects of time, uh, as in the, the pantheon. Nowadays, scholars are interested in, in understanding very uh, precisely how the, build, how the building has settled over time. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, they're interested in, in understanding some of the 
um, the subtle, um, let's call them asymmetries in the original design. And so uh, I think laser scanning has a, and photogrammetry, they have a uh, combination. They have really good uses if, if you're interested in those kinds of questions. Now, if you're interested in making a, a reconstruction of what the, pan the Pantheon looked like, you know, uh, then, you know, obviously you might use a different technique and you might build the model up from scratch using, you know, pure geometry. So I think these these methods of modeling and data collection, uh, texture mapping, and they have different uses uh, today. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely agree. And I should uh, say that I, I don't really know anything about glass. Um, so this was just a, a reflection of how uh, if you had a sense for a particular object of how it might weather over time, then you could project backwards from that. Um, but if you, again, if you're interested in capturing, like you were talking about, the, uh, the, 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 the craft of it or the settling or something, then you would, then you would definitely want to use um, some sort of a scanning technology. And you might want to combine that uh, with a material simulator. So you could take um, you know, a laser scan of this vase and get every little uh, bump that it has, uh, but then you could still run uh, the, the glass simulator on it and get a more, uh, possibly a truer or a more versatile um, digital record of how that would interact with light than if, than if you recorded you know, the one time uh, surface of, of the room that you were shooting in. All right, thanks.